Hello, and thank you for joining the Aaron Warner podcast on iCode Media. Today is a little bit different. I invited my good friend, Dr. Lori Sorensen, to come on. She gave the closing speech at a recent recent Women in Optometry Women's Leadership Conference that was held in conjunction with the American Academy of Optometry in New Orleans. Check out the YouTube version of this podcast to see the video that has her slides on it. Uh, but definitely enjoy the podcast. We had a fantastic discussion about being bold. We want to hear from you, so please join the conversation by leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and leaving a five-star review. Also, be sure to support those who support us. Discovering the impact of Life Meter this year has been truly transformative for motivating my patients with macular de- degeneration to embrace carotenoid supplements. With this non-invasive device, we can now quantitatively show that supplements are working. Life Meter assesses carotenoid concentration in the skin, reflecting fruit and vegetable intake, and indicating levels in other vital tissues like the retina and brain. Supported by over 30 peer-reviewed publications, Life Meter's accuracy, consistency, and effectiveness have been validated in 2,000 subjects of varying background. What's more, it offers the flexibility to prescribe the best suited products for each patient. My patients love knowing their numbers and witnessing improvements in as little as a month. Better yet, compliance with carotenoid supplements has surged, doubling our sales of MacuHealth since the Life Meters implementation. So this thing, you know, that I did, you know, it was basically a speech, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So when they said do the podcast, I was like, how does that, how's that, because I've done podcasts and they ask me a question and I answer it. Right. And then we have a conversation. And so how do, how do you see this playing out? Uh, I don't know. So I think we'll <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was bummed because I didn't get there in time and I wanted to, to hear the speech. Uh, you had emailed me ahead of time. And so the yes. topic, the topic was awesome and perfect for you. And so then I saw the list of uh, comments on Facebook and people saying they wanted to hear it. I said, well, let's give them that opportunity. So I'm going to start off by trying to be quiet and not jump in. Um, it, I thought you know it was easier it when you do, but it, I also would I mean, I don't know how that. I could see you and I going through these slides and we, us spending three hours on it. Because you oh, and I talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I really, I, I could see that for sure. You know examples of this or that or how that story ties into your story or mm-hmm. you know what I mean or even just asking more questions about my story because obviously you can't do that when you're doing a speech but um, so one thing I did was I it got I start off kind of emotional which is not normally me either no um, and um, because Joel had sent me, I'm trying to find it, a text right before I started. And I debated whether to read it out loud. And I did. And now if I can find it. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, and so I read it and went, oh, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> 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 it wasn't really because, you know, it kind of like brought them into my world a little bit before I got started. You know, and I right. kind of do that with Boo, too. I tell them my embezzlement story. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, and that's actually part of this. I talk about that, and in, in, that's in my, that's part of my, because I ended up just telling my story is what I did um, in way more detail than I typically tell my story. So that's 80% of the talk was that, if not more. So. Cool. Yeah. Nice. So what was the text all set? If I don't talk, ah, <laughs> this is as bad as what you sent me. So somebody was saying something about you, and um, and Eric was sitting in there, and he goes, oh, yeah, he sent her the nicest thing that anybody's ever sent her in her entire life. <laughs> he was there when I read it. <laughs> um, if I don't talk to you before your speech, good luck and knock it out of the park. Can't think of anyone better suited for the being bold talk than you. Look bold up in the dictionary and there's your picture. I love you and I'm so proud of you. You're my hero. So I sent that to Eric. I told him about it. Yeah. And he just wrote, ew. <laughs> well, that gave me chills. I know. I, it, I, 
yeah, it was, yeah. And, you know, he, he normally would go, but he was back home doing all the art for all the tables and stuff for the, for the wedding and the welcome party and all that stuff. So he, he really, he worked every minute I was gone. So, you know, I think he felt guilty not, not going to. <laughs> no. Well, but maybe that made it even better. Yeah. Right? If he yeah, couldn't be there. It's, yeah. So, yeah. very cool. Well, let's, let's jump in and uh, see if you can share your, your slides <coughs> and talk to it and we'll see how it goes. Actually, you know, before we get started the um, and jumping into it, the for those who don't know, you were speaking at the OWA event at Academy, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. OWA stands for uh, Optometric Women's Association or Optical so Women's I think, Association. I, th I think it's just WIO, Women in Optometry. Oh, it's a WIO. I think it's WIO, Women in Optometry, um, and I think Jobson Publishing puts it on, and it was a leadership conference. Um, it wasn't just for women. There were actually men in the audience too, um, but women in optometry uh, put it on. And um, but the the theme this year was be bold. Cool. Right, be bold, and you got to be the the closing speaker for it. Correct. I was the I was the closing speaker, um, and um, I really had a a tough time. I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about. Um, I talked to. Um, my son and my husband. I wrote you. I wrote a bunch of my friends and, and colleagues in optometry. And um, everybody just kept saying, tell your story. And I had, I had done a whole bunch of slides already. And uh, I just kept hearing over and over, tell your story. So, oh, by the way, that's my, uh, my baby that's on the way. We'll be here in February of Eric and Tiffany's. Um, Eric cool. is my son. Yeah, son and partner now. Um, so I asked my friends, and they said, you know, and then one of my friends, uh, Dr. Clark Newman, uh, affectionately known as Sparky, uh, called me and said, you know, just tell them your story. Tell them how you had all these goals. You know, you wanted to be president of the State Association. You wanted to get involved legislatively. You wanted to teach and, you know, end up with this big practice and, and multiple doctors. And I said, cool, I, I, okay, except that's not true at all. Um, <laughs> and I never had a goal, any of those goals, not a single one. Um, when I graduated from optometry school, my goal was to get a job. And if I made $70,000 a year, I was, I just knew that, you know, life would be good forever and I'd be perfectly fulfilled. Well, that's not what really happened. So currently now I teach at the school and I work with Vision Source as on practice management stuff and in the Austin area. TOA, I'm still the TOPEC chair. I've been president. I work with a, a charity um, called Half Helen and, and recently became a professional editor of Review of the Optometric Business. Not one single thing on there is something I ever had a long-term goal on. Um, it was just a matter of opportunities that came up and seeing situations and just getting motivated to do things, you know, in the moment. Um, but I did end up with a nine doctor single location practice, and that's the building we built uh, six, uh, when was it, eight, almost eight years ago. Yeah, eight years ago. And wow, it seems like it was just yesterday. And um, so I did end up with that. Again, I never had that as a goal. Um, these are my doctors. Somebody had a brilliant idea of having dogs in the picture. Me, bad idea. Um, it was it's a cute pure. picture. It is a cute picture. Pure and utter chaos. This is my son right there. This is my big dog. This is my little dog. Um, these two big dogs are hers. You can tell they're completely in love with her. Um, and this is my son's best friend um, who joined our practice last year. Um, and this is this is my son's dog too. So. Um, this is the normal picture that's actually hung up in, um, actually we have the dog picture in the hallway at the office and we have this picture somewhere else in the office. So, and this is my crazy staff, um, at Christmas, we've actually, actually added quite a few people since then. So managing all those people is a lot of fun. Uh, my son really helps a whole lot with that. So back to my story is what everybody told me to do. Talk about my journey. So, um, when I first graduated, I worked for two optometrists. Um, they had an office called, uh, several locations called the Viewpoint um, Eye Associates for the doctor side, and then they did an optical, a super optical that made glasses in two hours next door, and it was called the Viewpoint, which I thought was a really cool name. Yeah. Went to work for them within, 
a month or two, they ended up selling all their opticals to a company nobody heard of before called Lens Crafters. Um, and they were given the lease to all of the doctor's side in the southern United States. Um, and so they were managing that. Well, <laughs> while I was working for them, I, um, I was really a good associate doctor. You know, I stayed after hours, I painted walls, I, I ran office meetings, I was managing the staff, I was hiring, I was doing a lot of stuff like that. And I asked these two doctors, who I really like and respect a lot, um, for a raise for my front desk person. I even wrote a whole letter about all the things that she did, how great she was, and she was making, this was a long time ago, uh, $5 an hour, and I asked for a 50 cent an hour increase and they told me no so I always say in my life I have these you know some things are just like slowly get there and then there's other things in my life where I kind of have this weird click in my brain and that was my click I was like I can't work for somebody like this that I work this hard and they tell me no on something so simple what I didn't know is they were having financial issues lens crafters ended up kicking them out pretty pretty quickly. I went from there into a partnership with two different optometrists. And while I was there, very shortly thereafter, um, Lens Crafters came back to me and asked me if I wanted to take the lease over in that space when they basically kicked out their previous two optometrists because they were not paying the rent. And I looked at the numbers. I said, oh, okay, that, that sounds like a good deal. I'll do that and I'll sell this partnership to my husband at the time, who was an optometrist, and um, I thought it would take a year or two, you know, I thought legal stuff, you know, so I can prepare for this. No, about a week later, <laughs> I get a phone call and said, um, we're locking them out today, you need to open tomorrow. Oh. I'd never, I had, I didn't even know what a DBA was, I had no idea how, I mean, there, it was a, you know, pretty thriving practice. Um, I didn't know how to do payroll. I didn't know how to pay taxes. I didn't know. I didn't know how to do anything. And I had to open the next day. Wow. And I did. It was crazy. It was crazy. But that's probably not even my most crazy moment in my in my journey. But I had to oh, had to do that. So I got the Lens Crafters lease. During that time, um, I I got on the TOA board um, and started you know moving up the ladder as officer and all that stuff. And then while I was doing that. Um, with that Lens Crafters lease, there was a, a couple, the Tholins, um, Mark and Barbara Tholin worked for me in that lease part-time, and Mark had a private practice out in south of Austin in a small town, um, but he also worked for me part-time, and he just kept always encouraging me to open a private practice, but, you know, I was kind of happy with my situation. Well, then um, the strip center that I was in, it's a high high-end strip center that we were in, decided they wanted to put in a bookstore and they wanted to move the lens crafters around the corner. Well, that took it from, first of all, the lens crafters, the way it was designed was done by the doctors and it was big and it was pretty. And then it, they moved me around the corner into that ugly blue and khaki, I don't know if that's still how they are made now, but you know, a little, little you know, bowling alley type doctor side. And I, we were busy, we were, I think we were the third or fourth, I think we were the fourth busiest lens crafters practice in the country. Wow. Um, and so trying to do that into that little, you know, straw, small um, center was, was a challenge. I like challenges. So I wasn't, and I mean, I didn't like it. My patients didn't like it because the parking was a whole lot worse over on that side. Um, but I was okay. But this guy kept telling me I could do private practice. Well, then I had my next click. <laughs> <laughs> When we moved the practice, they picked a date. I was out of town on a Sunday. So I closed the practice and my staff moved us over into the new space while I was out of town. The regional manager went and told all the higher ups at Lens Crafters how awful I was because I closed for a whole day to move on a day when I was out of town. And that was another one of those clicks. I was like, you know, I did not go to school and work this hard to have some jerk talk to me that way and talk about me that way. So that's when I decided I'm going to sell the lens crafters and I'm going to open private practice. So that's what I did. Um, and I ended up opening cold. So I'm going to take a minute and shift gears for a second mm -hmm. and talk about what makes a good leader. 
um, there was this uh, analysis that was done, and Dory Carlson's the one that turned me on to this analysis, that talked about the four traits of su successful CEOs. It was a huge analysis of 17,000 CEOs. There was tons of interviews, you know, decades of research, and they decided that these were the four traits that were the most important, being decisive, reliable, they adapt boldly, and they're not scared of conflict, right? But what they found out was... Okay. Now what we're going to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Look, Flex, first I say, what we're going to do? Then you say, I don't know. What do you want to do? Then I say, what we're going to do? You say, what do you want to do? What we're going to do? What you want? Let's do something. Okay. What do you want to do? Right. <laughs> <laughs> they, by far, the most important thing was being decisive. And I think that when you're talking about being bold in an optometric practice or as an optometrist, being decisive is, is a huge part of that, right? Being decisive, being brave is, part of, is, is what being bold is all about. Um, so while I was doing research for this talk, I started, because it was at the Women in Optometry Conference, right? And so I don't usually look at things like female versus male and differences and all that stuff, but I started doing that for this conference in, in my research. And I started thinking about all the different doctors that I mentor. And both men and women sometimes have, have trouble being decisive, but I sometimes I think that some women have more of an issue with that. And I started looking at the research and found out that parents are four times more likely to tell girls and boys to be more careful. This was done in a, um, this was a study that was done in emergency rooms um, by pediatric psychology, psychologists. And, um, and then uh, this other woman, Reshma Sajani, um, she wrote a book. Um, she also wrote, uh, she's the founder of Girls Who Code, trying to get women to um, be more in the, the coding world and all, the, all that. And she says, we're raising our girls to be perfect, but we're raising our boys to be brave. And I, it made me think for a second about the way I was raised. And I honestly have no memory of my parents telling me to be careful. I have no, and I know they didn't tell me to be perfect for sure. Um, I don't remember the words brave, but I, ne I, I just, I could do anything. And we were allowed to, I was allowed to go down to the creek with the neighborhood, you know, boys in the neighborhood and climbing trees and fishing for crawdads and playing football with the whole, and I, they didn't even know where I was, right? So um, I think that part of that was my upbringing a little bit, why I don't have as much trouble with being decisive, is I didn't, I didn't catch that be careful, be careful stuff. Um, I do see it with uh, friends and family with their kids, mostly girls, but. So back to my private practice journey. Um, so I opened cold, uh, got pregnant. So I always say, you know, that's a terrible time to get pregnant right after you open a practice, right? It's like, it was terrible. Um, but is, when is a good time? <laughs> now? Never. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I can do it really good right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I think that ship has sailed, right? Um, problem was when I got pregnant too, I had to go on maternity leave. I mean, I had to go, I, I went into premature labor. So Ooh. here I just opened the practice and I went into premature labor and I was put on bed rest. So for 11 weeks in a brand new practice, I was not in the office. I was laying in bed on my left side. And um, that wasn't easy. I ended up um, hiring, well, actually I had a bunch of friends that came in and saw some of my patients for a little while, which was really nice, but not for 11 weeks. And uh, then I ended up hiring a doctor that somebody, she was playing softball on the local optometry team, um, had just come to town, had started practice down south, and they, they said, you know, she, she's looking for some uh, fill-in work. So I hired her to come in, I don't even remember how much it was, a couple days a week. So she did that. Um, she ended up becoming, uh, working, selling that practice, becoming, or closing that practice, I guess, and coming to work for me full-time and eventually becoming my partner. Um, so right from the beginning, I ended up having a doctor uh, in my practice, which is kind of unusual. Most people build their practice up and get really busy, and then they hire an associate doctor. I had one from, you know, almost day one. During that whole beginning time, within four years, I was president of the Texas Optometric Association, so I was really kind of busy. Um, 
I also had been uh, picked to be the Benedict Professor of Practice Management at UHCO during that exact same time. Um, so I uh, had to <laughs> come up with a whole day seminar on practice management, which was tough since I was scared of public speaking at the time. And um, so I was super, super busy. And then I found out that my partner was embezzling from me. So this whole time that I was super busy, she had ended up taking over the books and was paying her best friend had started a practice. And she, um, there were several times I asked her about it and she, and she was my partner, right? She couldn't be a partner with somebody else. Well, that obviously she was. And she was using my checkbook to pay the bills for this other practice. Um, amongst other things, um, I was paying her student loans that I didn't know anything about and some things like that. So here I was, president of TLA, oh, I was the Benedict Professor of Practice Management, I'm supposed to be a good business person, and obviously I wasn't because I wasn't paying attention enough to even know that I'd been embezzled from for years at that point in time. So that's when I decided I needed to become a better business person. Um, I ended up really enjoying that part of the practice. Um, and then I found out that I really enjoyed helping other doctors become better business owners too. Um, and I think, you know, one of my core values is to try to make a difference, especially for my family and for my optometry family. And um, so I, I always talk about how this was seriously one of the worst times of my entire life was during this whole embezzlement process when everything that was going on with my life. But it was also probably one of the very best things that ever happened to me um, to get me where I am today. Um, so, you know, it, it, things work out for a reason, right? So, skipping 20 whole years, <laughs> after opening the practice at age 56, I decided to build a building, 11,000 square foot building, 100% financed and go into a lot of debt. I definitely had multiple people tell me that actually a friend of mine who had already paid off his building, he's only two years older than me, when I told him I was doing this, he goes, oh man, you're too old to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Good friend of mine. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure I will never pay off the building, but it still has made a lot of sense and I've really enjoyed it. So I opened uh, the practice in 95, the building was in 2015, and Eric, my son, became a partner in 2021. And here's the building, beautiful building that we built. Um, in 2015. So I think um, that the whole theme of the conference was about being bold. And I think you've, you've got to be willing to take risk, right? right? That's what being bold man, means. Um, and I think for me, I always, one way that I think that I, I, I can take a risk is that if it doesn't work, you know, I'll fix it. I'll either stop doing it or I'll change it or whatever. I, you know, I kind of have this attitude. I have a history. You know, I've been doing this a long time, and so far everything's worked out pretty darn well. Um, you know, get embezzled from and still end up having a successful practice. Mm -hmm. um, so can I get this attitude, oh, we can do this. Um, and I saw this from David Viscott Risking. He said, if you can't risk, you can't grow. If you can't grow, you can't become your best. If you can't be your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, what else matters? So to me, this kind of embodies how I kind of think about it. So... But being bold and being brave does not mean that you're not scared, right? Mm -hmm. I was, I think one of the scariest things I ever did was building this building. I know that sounds weird. So when I was going through that thought process of, process of building this building, I went into this, you know, best case, worst case scenario, right? Best case is what everybody will tell you. Oh, it's the best decision I ever made was building a building, right? I mean, you hear that from everybody. Um, and I was terrified because I knew my expenses were doubling overnight, overnight. And um, so I decided, what's the worst case scenario? This helps me a lot. I don't know that it helps everybody if you have a lot of anxiety. Maybe this wouldn't help as much. But my son told me that he's not, he's more risk averse than me. And he said thinking through this like I do um, really helps him with all the risks that we take in the practice. He's gotten really good at being much more of a risk taker since he started practicing here. Um, still struggles with it a little bit. But the um, building the building, what's the worst case scenario? Doesn't I can't pay. Yeah, it doesn't work. I, I can't make the payments, right? Yeah. I go bankrupt. 
right? I have to downsize my house. I lose the building. I end up having to go get a job as an optometrist, still making more money than probably 90% of the population in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, not good, right? It's not what I want, but it's not the end of the world. No. So I can, I can take that risk. And this was one of my bigger risks, I think, because um, I didn't have the click that made me like angry. <laughs> and have that motivation, right? I had a great landlord and I had really good pricing. So this was, I was definitely not, this was a much better idea than where I was before. So that really helped me a lot. I just, I got in that mode and when I can think about the worst case and go, you know what, I'll survive that. I can take all those fears and I can put them behind me the vast majority of the time and just not let that, you know, get in the way of my decision making and, and moving forward. So for me, that helps a lot. Do you do that? Uh, I do. I try to take the, I try to recognize the emotion and like the, the, the stomach brain and uh -huh. say, okay, it's, you know, the world's going to end. Everything's going to turn out horribly. You'll be destitute. Your kids will eat Top Ramen forever. And then I remember that they <laughs> like Top Ramen and, uh, <laughs> and cup of noodles. Um, but then you go to the, I try to go to the facts too, saying, well, you know, what does that really mean? You know, okay, if I have to declare bankruptcy, that's seven years of not being able to buy a you know, fancy new car, but I don't want a fancy new car anyway. And I know I can work hard enough to pull myself out of it. So it's, I try to match the, the emotional what ifs with the, the tactical what ifs and then realize that if that's the worst it's going to be, you know, there are worse things. Yeah, for me that helped, I, I just need to get that out of my brain. Mm -hmm. And then, then I can, then I feel like I can move forward. The other thing that I do, so that's like probably more for these bigger ones, like building a building or some crazy stuff. But the other thing we do is I'm getting ready to give you a list of some stuff that we've done that might not on the surface look like it was a great idea from a business perspective. Um, but I just did this last week with my staff. There's something that we're, we're implementing new and I was getting some pushback from some of the opticians and I said, here's the deal guys, you know, let me tell you the big picture, why we're doing it, which I'd already done, but I repeated it. And I said, but here's, here's the deal. We're going to do it for three months. And if it doesn't work out, we'll stop. I promise. Now, sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's a year, because sometimes it's a project that you're doing and you've paid a year ahead of time, which I'll talk about that in a second. And, um, but three months is usually my go-to. Um, it gives you time enough to fix all the little problems and see if it really will work. And I have definitely, st I've pulled the plug before three months. When I told them three months before, there was something in the contact lens world I did years ago. Um, oh, actually, I think, it, believe, believe it or not, I think it was CLX when, I, when it wasn't integrated. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I was getting so much pushback. And then when it got integrated, we went all in. And of course, you use it all the time now. Um, but the three months is a, um, I think it's a, another way where I can go, okay, I've made, we've made the decision, why we made the decision, and we're gonna do it for three months. I'm not gonna think about it anymore. All I'm gonna do is try to make it work. I'm just, as I always say, I'm gonna whole ass one thing, never half ass two things. We're gonna whole ass this thing for three months and see if it works, right? Um, who was that from uh, Parks and Rec? Oh, oh, it excellent. was. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, Can't think of his name. Me neither. I'm blanking. Yeah. Begins anyway. With an R. Yeah. Oh, I can't think of it. Okay. So let me give you a list. Um, I went with, over this with my son. Some things that we've done in our practice. So this is a little bit more the practice management side. Um, and a lot of people took like uh, pictures at the conference of, of my list. Um, I did split it into two slides, by the way. Um, because of Donna Mikula, she said the slides were too wordy, which I totally agreed with her. Um, so top five were, I ended up, I forgot about this, Eric brought it up. I hired three doctors in less than six months. Um, I know, right? Uh, so what happened was my, I had a doctor who left to go, that I hired, my first male doctor actually, and he just, he decided he wanted to go work for um, University of Houston at a clinic up in Dallas area. It's kind of a charity clinic. And um, then, so I hired his friend, um, Dr. O'Smiley. And so she was only gonna work for six months. And she wanted, she actually thought our practice wouldn't have enough pathology to make her, you know, I don't know. 
she, happy. She was that a, was her thing. She was a happy gal. She had, you know, she did a residency in pathology, and so she wanted to be. She thought she wanted to be more like a hospital setting or that type of thing. And um, I had already decided to hire another doctor to do some neurovisual stuff in our practice. She was a previous intern of mine, so I'd already been talking to her. So I was about to add that another doctor. So one doctor. Well, my son was graduating in six months, and so he was going to take over from Dr. Smiley. Well. Dr. Smiley's still here. <laughs> that was four years ago. <laughs> so she never left. So I ended up keeping her on, adding my son, and taking on Dr. Catalosson full time. Um, and uh, she's one of our neurovisual doctors. She also does some other stuff too. But um, so I ended up doing all that in less than six months. So that might not have seemed smart, but it was ended up being a brilliant move. They were a little not super busy during the first six months to twelve months, but they still made good money, um, and it worked out well. So there's another one, um, which I know you know about this one too. I bought a $200,000 Silverstone when we already had a Monaco and a Daytona paid for. So that doesn't seem smart, right? Because I'm already making all that money off of Optos, you know, screenings, and now I've got a, that had already been paid for, and so it was all profit. Now I'm gonna add this debt in there and I'm not gonna make any more money. Well, I raised my fees. And I make, I'm making more money now than I did before, which I, I could have raised my fees bef and not before. got the silver stone, but I don't think I would have, right? Because because no. it was already paid for, so yeah. it worked out really well. We're actually quite profitable with it. Nice. Um, Did that drive efficiencies too? You know, no. I wouldn't say it drove more efficiencies. I would say it's so cool. <laughs> so, like, we had a retinal detachment last week, and we could take an OCT over the whole detachment. That's cool. You can see the whole secret. Yeah, so you could tell it was a detachment and not a schesis. Um, and it was clear as a bell. It was really cool. So it does just stuff like that out in the periphery. You're like, oh, is that this or is it this or is it this? And it's just fun to look at too. Um, and it doesn't take very long to do it. So I just wanted it. Well, there's a, so. there's a, uh, something to be said for the joy cool factor, right? When you, Correct. When I, when I asked you that question, your face just lit up, right? So it's... <laughs> it. Uh, you know, happy, we, we, we do this to be happy. We don't do this because it, it, I don't pick up trash for, you know, as a trash man or do other jobs that I wouldn't like to do. There's got to be a happiness factor. And, you know, I have eight associate, well, I have one partner and, and seven associate docs now too. And I want them to be happy here. I don't, you know, we don't have turnover with them or anything. And, um, you know, pretty much if they go anywhere else, they're not going to have as cool equipment as we have. <laughs> so <laughs> I would hope that would help, you know, retain them some, I think. Um, so, you know, there's not very many Silverstones in the country at this no. point. So, And then we almost always hire inexperienced staff. I mean, you have to have a good uh, onboarding program, which mm -hmm. we do in business optometry that I created to, to help us do that. And we really kind of perfected that a lot. Uh, um, we just hired somebody with a little bit of experience from another vision source practice recently. Um, but you know, we, you know, it's, we have different systems, right? Yeah. So we still used our same onboarding program, but she had some experience in that other office. Um, but I can't remember the last time we hired somebody with experience before that. Um, and I think it's in my, it, it'll be in, I'll talk about her in just a second because I'll bring her up. And I, we have not had patients fill out paperwork since I opened my practice in 1995. Wow. Which was kind of a thing back then, right? Yep. Um, you know, I didn't do it back then. I started off with an EHR in 1995. It was a DOS system. It was actually an office mate DOS, um, which was actually very efficient but not very versatile, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but we've done that from, for a really long time. And recently we started shipping glasses directly from the lab to the patient. That's not for everybody, obviously, but um, it has made us significantly more efficient in giving our um, lab people significantly more time to, to do other things. Um, it's working really well, um, but I know that's not for everybody. So I also have an honorable mention slide. <laughs> <laughs> So we paid for Treehouse Eyes, even when we already had a myopia management program in place. We were struggling getting it where I wanted it, and that has more than paid off. Um, we've always paid extra for staff when they work on Saturdays, but I was, I was always like $3 an hour or $20. And then I think it was right after COVID, I decided to make it real and start paying them an extra $50 for every staff person on a Saturday. 
um, if they work, I think, at least the six, six of the seven hours or something like that. I don't remember what the rules are now. Um, and we don't have any trouble staffing Saturdays anymore. Plus, it feels right, and it's still extremely profitable. Our Saturdays are extremely profitable. We've never done bonus commissions. Um, we've always paid health insurance for staff. I don't pay 100%, but I pay whew, a lot, <laughs> way over 80%. Um, probably closer to, it depends on which which one they get you know I usually try to hit one uh, plan that it, we're paying significant like 90 to 95 percent so that they're not much out of pocket um, but it's not the best plan and then they can pay more to get a better plan and then I said a minute ago about hiring both candidates that woman I just told you about that had some experience she kind of came in after the fact after Eric had already started doing interviews and he had already decided to hire two people and then this woman shows up. Mm. So we hired three <laughs> at the same time. So um, and that's working out really well. With as many staff as we have, we know we're going to have turnover. And that's something I tell even smaller practices too. You're trying to decide between two people, and I know you already told me you're struggling with one of your other employees. You know, hire them both um, if you're in growth mode. You know, if you're struggling, cash flows you know rough and you're not in growth mode that's a different story but if you're in growth mode I you rarely go wrong going ahead and hiring both but no. it depends on what, what's your take on on being lean and I think when it comes to staff it, it I've got a very strong opinion on being lean with staff but I'm curious on yours I try to look at where I need my staffing in three months hmm. so if and you can look at it, you can see the dates we hire people. It's, it's kind of funny because they're very much clumped together. So if I know like in um, July, and this isn't always true because you might have somebody like we just had some leave on maternity leave and we had somebody go back to school and so then we'll hire. But if, I, if I'm thinking we need to hire in July or we might need to hire in July, I think, okay, we're talking about October, November, two worst months of the year, right? We're gonna be slow. We don't need to hire yet. But do I hire in October, in November? A lot, yeah. because December and January is gonna be crazy busy. So we tend to like hold off when we see the three months from now is gonna be slow for a couple of months, but then we will be a little bit more aggressive when we know in two to three months we're gonna be busy. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't looked at the uh, where I am in three months. I always try to be one head count over where I need. Oh, me too. At least, and I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't run a, a sports team and manage a sports team without a backup. And yep. so I, I definitely don't want to manage a, uh, a, an office without one. I just figure if somebody's out for whatever reason, you know, it could be horrible or they could have just won the uh, mega millions jackpot and, you know, told me to pound sand because they're never coming back again. Either way, I'm down a head count. So if I'm out one person or if I'm out two people, can I still run? Yeah. So think about this for a second. This is something that I've, I've said to other people before, um, especially the little, the uh, little, uh, I shouldn't say that, my mentees um, of the uh, newer practices. Yeah. Um, I always think of them as my children, right? Um, that's why I said little. Um, but uh, let's say that you have 10 employees. Let's say that in our practice, they get, after their first year, they get 120 hours, up to 120 hours PTO, Plus we have seven paid holidays. So that is full, that's a month. Yeah. So if you have 10 employees, what that means is 10 months of the year, you're short one person. Mm -hmm. So in my practice, we have 40 something employees. Think about that. 40 months of the year, which is more than right, <laughs> we're, we're short someone, which means we're actually short three to four people every month. So if we're not overstaffed by three or four, we're understaffed. Yep. Which is basically what you just said, but it's like the thought process of your PTO. Um, and that's a planned time off, much less emergencies or anything weird going on. So I, yeah, I think, one, I think if there's one thing that I push my mentees all the different doctors that i help when they first start their practices to do it's hire more people yeah for sure um, yeah it's they'll tell me their numbers i go girl you got you need two more people like you need to hire somebody um i probably say that more than i do anything else 
And probably second would be, yeah, you need to fire that one. That's the second thing I probably <laughs> yeah. said. Urban I said it this morning, as a matter of fact, to one of them. Um, and then this paying for ASL and Spanish classes um, and CPR classes, um, that came from one of my employees when I asked what should I talk about that, you know, you think it's different, um, that might not have looked like a smart thing to do at the beginning. I think this just shows them that we care about their growth. Um, we do see a lot of deaf people, but, you know, to get good enough to talk to a deaf person ASL will take a long time, so will Spanish, but um, it's just helping them with their growth. You know, we started closing in the middle of the day for lunch. We do learning, we do fun stuff, um, and pay them for lunch and pay them during that time. That We've been doing that for a long time. We do Thursday, Thursday. Thursday happy hours at the office quarterly um, and we close down a little bit early and we will do uh, we provide drinks and food and sometimes a taco truck and sometimes do karaoke um, play Jenga you know cornhole all that kind of stuff so we do that just for fun we just do it at the end of the day and then probably one of the bigger things is letting my son take over all the hiring actually that's not even true I didn't let him take over all the hiring he just did it he just took it <laughs> He just took it. And I asked him the other day, I said, what we were doing, I don't know what we were doing, what's your favorite thing to do in the office? And he said, hiring. Like, what's wrong with him? Who exactly. likes to hire? <laughs> I didn't hate it, but to like it, he's just so good at it. He's got it all figured out. And we have that video on uh, yep. Insight in Business Optometry, I believe, right? In yep. the uh, in resources. Yep. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have watched it, um, and they just step by step do exactly what he said, and they they've it's it's really helped them a lot. So he's he's gotten really good at it. That's so cool. you know, can I share something on that? Because I, uh -huh. I like Eric. I'm a multi generation, and when I joined the practice, Dad let me start taking over lots of things, and it it, it was really cool to assume that responsibility, kind of knowing there was a safety net you know, in, in my case, my dad, in Eric's case, you, but really owning that responsibility out of the gate and uh, having the training wheels off. Um, and I think that that helped me grow much more quickly because I, I had to assume that risk. I had to assume that responsibility, whether I had a good hire or a bad hire, I made a good decision, bad decision. And in watching Eric's growth, I think a lot of that uh, is kudos to you by saying, yeah, I've got this giant nine doctor practice. It's a lot of responsibility if you hire the wrong person or if you make the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. But but doing it, it helps them grow that much better. And I think it made our practice uh, grow even more because I was able to, I don't want to say get up to speed, but comfortable with making decisions, comfortable with taking on risk earlier than I might have otherwise been. That might be a cool podcast for it you to be. do with Eric and maybe somebody else who is a multi-generational practice too, um, just to see what the... Uh, good stuff, bad stuff was, and that could be fun. That would uh, be fun. Yeah, I think that could be really cool. All right, so um, I think I used those three things to help me be more decisive, you know, as thinking the worst case in the three months. So the other thing I did was, as Aaron knows, is I asked some of my colleagues and friends um, what I should talk about. And actually what I also asked them was, I think my question was, can you think of something that I have said or taught or done that you thought um, was in the same uh, vein as the theme for this leadership conference, which was Be Bold. And um, I got some really interesting feedback, uh, a lot from Aaron, as a matter of fact. And, you know, it was, yeah, it was kind of an emotional thing for me to see all this stuff. I wasn't what I expected people to tell me, actually. Um, that they, and this one, some of these first ones are actually from Aaron, he said that he sees me be bold when I'm um, decisive, even when I'm scared of something. Again, using that whole worst case scenario or three month scenario is, is helpful to admit when I'm wrong, which, you know, I got to because I'm wrong a lot, <laughs> and allow others to be wrong with grace. Again, um, if I'm wrong, you know, I, I, I need the grace too, right? So that's easy to do. Um, and sharing the spotlight elevates everyone. I kind of have this thing. I, I remember one time watching um, somebody up on stage. It was actually a TOA thing. And I was sitting next to actually Dr. Ron Hopping. Mm -hmm. And the guy up on stage started talking about some idea or some program like it was his. And I knew the story. And it was Ron's. I was so angry for him. 
<laughs> and he's like, whatever. And I'm like, no, that's not right. So I think I have some kind of innate, always make sure you give people credit where credit's due, right? Um, that, that just seems so wrong to me. So I think that's where my share the spotlight comes from, is maybe that it's, I don't know, wrong to, to not give credit. Um, and then, so when I showed Eric this slide, my son, um, I had down, you know, to, to, to live your core values. And he goes, you know, Mom, if I saw that on somebody's slide, I'd go, you know, whatever. That's just like airy-fairy stuff. And I was like, and he said, what, you need to tell him what that actually means to you. And, and he actually said this, which is that when we're trying to make a decision or when something's going wrong in the office or even in our personal life, that if we have these core values that we reference, then it helps make your decision, your decision becomes so clear. And so in our office, our core values are to be friendly, efficient, truthful, compassionate, and that we have fun. Um, and so it's so much easier to think back to what those core values are in our mission statement, which is to wow our staff, patients, and our, in our community. Um, but it, things can always go back to that, and it, helps, it really helps make those decisions. So, um, and then I have some personal core values too. I think one of my bigger ones, which I talked about earlier, was is just to make it, try to make a difference for my family, my optometry family, um, and try to be helpful and help people live their best lives, I think, um, as much as I can, a little bit I can. Um, stand up for who and what you believe in. This came from another optometrist, because, which is kind of funny. I've gotten myself in trouble on this one before. Um, I was told when I was moving up in the TOA st structure, there was uh, someone that was basically not going to be allowed to be on the board because there was a story about him, which I knew was, they didn't know the whole story and wasn't true. And, you know, I was like fighting for him. And um, the president at the time came to me and said, you need to be quiet because, you know, you're trying to, you know, be an officer and, you know, you're hurting yourself. And I go, I don't care. Like, if this association doesn't want, I can't say what I believe in this association, I don't want to be a part of it. So it didn't hurt me whatsoever, by the way. And um, I did get the guy, the guy did get on. Um, and the story got told correctly. Um, so things like that, you know, if it's right, it's right. And what does Ted Lasso say? Uh, it's never wrong to do the right thing. Nope. Um, so I believe that very strongly. Um, I have no trouble seeking help. <laughs> and I don't know something. <laughs> I think that comes with years of experience of going, you know, there's no way for me to, to, to know everything. I've always had a consultant. Um, I've always had mentors. Um, so, you know, just because I help other people sure doesn't mean I don't need help. And uh, this came from another doctor, uh, a friend of mine, colleague of mine, and she says, it amazes me how you still trust people even after some of the stuff that's happened to you, that you always go there first, um, that you just assume everybody's, and I think most people are trying to do the right thing the vast majority of the time. Um, and so I think that's uh, been positive. I'm, obviously comfortable sharing my struggles and telling people about all the tough times that I've had. Um, and then this was from Joe Deloach. He says, in business, the patient's first damn the system, which drives him crazy sometimes <laughs> since he's my compliance guy. Um, but I'm like, you know, I don't care if you can't do it that way. It's the right thing for the patient, so I'm going to do it anyway. Probably not always the right thing to do, like the smart thing to do, but I think it's the right thing to do. Um, so, so at the end of the, the conference, I just said, you know, Remember to be decisive, be brave, even when you're scared, and let's be bold, like Dory Carlson, um, who was our first female uh, AOA president. Um, I have a lot of respect for her. She just got her MBA in um, leadership a couple of years ago, and um, she and I have a lot of fun conversations about this kind of stuff. Yeah, Dory's great. I love Dory. Yeah, and then, then my funny last little slide. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's it. I like it. So I've got a, a question for you for those that aren't, um, and I apologize, my camera somehow glitched out so you get to stare at a black screen. Oh, okay. And, um, but um, for those that don't feel brave, don't feel bold, is it something you're born with or is it something you can, you can develop? Is it a skill or a I trait? 
Yes. <laughs> I, I think for someone like me, it's a trait, right? Like I, I definitely, but I definitely think I've honed it over time. As a matter of fact, I, I'm almost the opposite that I'm can be too decisive and too bold. Mm -hmm. So having someone like my son, my husband, my friends, my colleagues to help keep slow me down a little bit, it's actually a good thing. So I think, I think the, I think the answer is to know yourself, mm -hmm. right? So if you know you have trouble with being decisive, with, which a lot of people with a perfect personality, everything has to be perfect before I move forward, having a mentor in place, knowing that about yourself, being able to look in the mirror, having a mentor in place to help you know, push you to the next step, I think is super important. Um, but I, and I think that's why I gave the worst case scenario idea and the three month idea. For me, those are two ways that somebody who struggles with decisions can can move to that next step. And I think the more you do something, it's just like my son. If you look at his profile, which we've done several times, he is very risk averse. And he, this is the kid that came, kid, <laughs> this is the doctor partner um, who came up with the idea of expanding our building which we're planning on doing. I mean, he's doing all kinds of things that are taking risks at this point in time. Um, and, um, and I think it's, I, I think he's developed that skill on the right way to do it and put it in the right place in his brain. He's got me to help him, right? right? Also be you know supportive, like when he's really stressing over something, I'm like, ah, it'll work out. Um, and sometimes you need somebody to say, ah, it'll work out, right? Um, so I, I do think it's easier for some people, for sure. Yeah. But it can be developed too. Absolutely. You can, you can work on just, you know, answering where you want to go to dinner. Right? That's True. the biggest fight my wife and I get into. I don't <laughs> no, care where you to go, you know, Mexican, not Mexican. <laughs> Anywhere else. I give, I give three options and I tell my husband to pick one. That's what I do. There you go. <laughs> but I have one of my mentees that I've, she's been, she's been a mentee of mine for a really long time. She's a very strong, perfect personality. She is very risk averse. Um, and um, she, this is what she tells me. She channels me. She thinks, what would Laurie say? And sometimes she calls me, of course, but some, she knows enough now to know what I'm going to tell her. And she has a big old practice, owns her building, um, has three or four doctors working for her now. Um, and She's been pretty aggressive on uh, growing and all that kind of stuff. So Anne had to go through divorce, um, yeah, during this process, um, and um, which really put her in a, I mean, it's a tough, tough place for her to be. And um, she's done so well. And I really think she's just, and she's getting better and better and better at it because she's having to make more and more of those decisions and be more decisive, um, be bolder. One of the things I picked up on, and uh, you probably recognize this too, is throughout your talk, you always reference people along the way. And, and not just mentors, but support. Uh, I don't want to say support group because it's not therapy, but just somebody to bounce ideas off of, somebody to uh, a group to, to get input from. Um, you know, Even for this talk, and I've got to tell you, when you sent me the, the email saying, hey, give me some thoughts, you probably didn't think twice of it. I was mm -mm. blown away that Lori Sorensen would be asking me you know, my input on what she should talk about and, and herself, because I, I hold you in such high regard as one of my mentors, but you've always, seems like you've always had the group that you're comfortable being vulnerable with and asking help from, and I'm assuming they're the same back with you. Yeah. You're one of my newer ones. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Bethany Fishbein, she's uh, the CEO of Power Practice now. She was my consultant with Power Practice years ago. She still is, basically. But um, she's just, she's somebody I really go to um, when I'm struggling with stuff, too. She's got, she's super insightful, so she's been a big help for me. Um, you and Mick Kling, obviously, are big ones. Joe Loach huge right especially if you want to hear the don't do this stuff um it's a really good one and my son honestly just running things through him i run stuff through him all the time um including this talk and uh, several times with that um and my husband you know too um he's a lot more of a let's do it type person so i kind of need somebody on the other side let's slow down the person and he's definitely 
definitely not a let's slow down person. He's, you know, there's never, he's a yes man. Um, he wants to do everything. Um, but it's kind of nice to have that in your corner too, right? Oh, yeah. I think you need hype people. You need somebody to slow you down. And uh-huh. you, know, you, you need all four of the, uh, the personalities in our world just to see mm-hmm. all the perspectives and all the different sides. I think that's true. I, and even just talking to uh, all the mentees that I have, uh, you know, all the young people, you know, I just, you know, yes, they're asking me for advice, but man, I learn from, I learn from that so much too, right? Because there are different situations come up and having to think through that thought process and figure out what's the right thing to do. As a matter of fact, today, was it this morning? I think it was this morning, one of them texted me and Eric and I came back with an answer, and then he came back with an answer. It was basically the conclusion was the same, but his reasoning process was different. And I was like, oh, that's really good. <laughs> so, you know, it, it will help me help somebody else even more down the road, too. Yeah. Oh, that's super cool. And, and I love having, you know, young docs reach out and even experiencing things that I'll never have a chance to experience, but with through them. You know, mm-hmm. chances to buy other practices or different speaking opportunities or, you know different uh different equipment type stuff it's it's fun mm-hmm. to live vicariously through them see their excitement and because i get to feel that joy as well yeah and you know I, a lot of them have i think covid did this too there's a lot of anxiety out there too oh, yeah. and um uh i i don't know that i'm as good at helping them with that so, um uh just because i i don't think i've ever had too much of that um but uh i learned a lot from it um because it's it's you know it's pervasive in our my practice and in these younger docs and um, that's that's a that's a tougher thing to to work with for sure and help out. Yeah, definitely. But I think you're really good at helping just grounding. You know, you don't you don't have to live up to all the expectations that are put on us from the outside. Live up no. to your expectations of yourself, but not necessarily what everybody else thinks that you should be doing. That's how you started this. All the goals that yeah. you never had that everybody thought you had. Yeah, <laughs> everybody know, right? put on you. And I, I didn't. I just, I just ha- things just kept happening. You know, somebody would, um, I would get passionate about talking about one thing. I remember okay, how I got involved with AOA was I got a phone call trying to raise money for, I think it was the AOA pack. And it was somebody who didn't know what they were talking about. And I found it really annoying. So I wrote... I don't know, I guess I wrote a letter because we didn't have email back then. I don't know what I did. Um, but I wrote and said, you know, this was a terrible way to do this. I did not like it at all. Guess who called me? The president of the OA. <laughs> and then he puts me on a committee. So, <laughs> so then I started getting involved in that kind of stuff. And then I got involved with TOA. And, you know, one of my teachers back then put me on a committee for TOA. And so it just kept happening. And, and, and also I think... Um, I always, I feel like a lot of times I've been put in situations where, just like when I got embezzled from, I was put in a situation, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be the Benedict professor of practice management, and I felt, you know, that I was an imposter, like an imposter syndrome, right? And so imposter syndrome for me personally is probably my biggest motivator. So when I became legislative chair, um, I was like, oh, I was following Jody Loach, by the way, so I was like, uh, crap, you know, nobody even knows who I am. I am, and we still use it to this day, I created a spreadsheet with all the um, legislators who their key contacts were, with comments, you know, all, all the different kind of stuff that, that you need to know. And I did it for me because I wanted to know them all. I wanted to know more about all the legislators in the country, I mean, in the state, than anybody else did so that I didn't feel like such an imposter. I kind of did the same thing when I was on the AOA committee. Um, it was the statutory scope, which is about all the state um, uh, scope laws. Mm-hmm. I memorized everybody's scope laws. I knew all 50 states um, scoped. I, wow. I, I knew them on the back of my hand because here I was on this committee. Nobody knew how it, what, I knew what they were thinking. They were thinking, you know, call put me on this committee because he likes me. And... <laughs> And she, you know, she's not very smart or something. So I, I had to make sure that I really knew. I, said, I knew more than the rest of the committee did on what the, um, what the state laws were. Um, but that was totally because I felt like an imposter. Um, and, but that helped, that helped a lot. You took that as motivator. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I think I, 
I do that in a lot of ways and it helps get me to be better. Nice. Well, Lori, this was fun. Well, you and I could talk forever, but for the sake I of know. everybody <laughs> listening, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to, to set this up again. But I appreciate you, uh, you sharing your, uh, your, your talk with us, your speech with us. That was, uh, uh, that was great. And like I said, I, I think I, I could not think of a better person to talk about being bold. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. I uh, appreciate oh, I all you do. So, well, well, go have fun the rest of your day. I'm sure you've got uh, a thing or two lined up. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> we'll talk later. Okay. Bye, Aaron.